Thanks so much for hopping on. We appreciate it. We do this once a month where we do a live training session for agency owners. And this time we wanted to bring Andrew back. And Andrew is going to talk about how to buy an insurance agency. When you buy an insurance agency, that could be the best thing that you can do for your business or the absolute worst thing that you do for your business. And Andrew is not a newbie at this game. You've bought six, you bought five books in five the last bucks. six years. You've been an agent for six years, agency mm -hmm. for six years, but in the business longer. And uh, you have grown your business to 40 million in premium. That's impressive. 40 million in premium. And it wasn't just because you bought a lot of books. You also write a lot of new business. Andrew, Absolutely. Yeah. Andrew's uh, the total package. He's good at writing new business and also growing through acquisition. So when you do something once, twice, three times, there's going to be a lot of hard lessons that you learn along the way. And what Andrew's going to do is in the next 30 minutes, take his his lessons that he learned and package it into a short training for us here. Sounds great, man. So last webinar that I did, you know, about a month ago was on internet leads, right? Presented by the, the newsletter. This one's presented by Next Call Club. And so what we want to do is we want to teach uh, people, you know, how to buy an insurance agency if they've never done it. And for the people who have done it or looking to continue to do it, what are some ways that we can add some value so you don't make some of the same mistakes that we have made? But I also want to share how we think about acquisitions. And before we even get started, one of the burning questions that always comes up with agents, and, and I feel like we've all asked ourselves this question at some point, I've asked myself this question, uh, me and my business partners ask ourselves these questions, and we say, should we grow organically or should we grow through acquisitions? And the question is phrased in a way that's so black and white. It's phrased to say, should I do this or should I do that? And the answer is, you should do both. You should do both in a strategic way. And so, you know, Vlad, you talked about the five books that we've bought. We're about 40 million in premium. And the reality is only about 10 million of that, I think it's more like nine, has been acquired. The other 31 million has been written organically or through rate increases or, you know, the traditional way of growing an agency. And so what I always tell people is don't think about should I build organically or through acquisitions, do both. Use acquisitions to fund organic growth, right? These things work together. They don't work in isolation. And so here's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on me, you know, why you should listen to me or, or why I think you should listen to me, uh, give, let you know me a little bit better. I'll talk a little bit about numbers and how they pertain to buying an insurance agency. And everyone always asks, what multiple should I pay? So we'll talk about multiples. I will cover how to find agencies, how to buy them, and some of the things to look for. And then I'll talk about how do we set goals around acquisitions and lead ourselves in a way to move forward in a way that gives us no regrets on the purchases that we've made. Because like Vlad said, a purchase can be amazing for you. It can be a nightmare for you. And so let's dive right in. You know, So this is the same exact slide I shared last month. But for those who are new here, a little bit about me. I'm one of the co-founders of Peachy Insurance. That's, that's the agency. We opened about six years ago. Six-year anniversary is July 1st, 2024. So I think we're about uh, 15 days away from, from the six-year celebration. And we've grown from zero to 40 million in under six years. And so one of my goals was to hit 40 million by that six-year mark. We did it. Uh, if I'm being fully honest with you, the rate increases have helped tremendously with that. You know, one of the great things about being an insurance agent is that yes, rate increases are hard. Yes, underwriting guidelines are tough right now. But when we take rates, more people stay than leave and we grow as a result. I talk a lot about what my expertise is and, and lead management is something I have both a passion for and in a lot of enjoyment in doing. I've got a lot of experience doing it and that's where Next Call Club comes in. However, it's not the only thing that we do. If we zoom out on why I love doing lead management is because it, you have to be very strategic to do it well. And acquisitions are no different. You need to think strategically. There's a lot of agencies out there for sale. So how do we pick the right agency or agencies to purchase? To give myself a little bit more clout, I recently finished my MBA at Georgia Tech. I focused in marketing. It was an amazing experience. I know a lot of people asked me, I said, if you are a business owner, why are you spending $80,000 to go get an MBA? I promise you, it was one of the best investments I ever made. I was surrounded by incredibly ambitious, intelligent people. I learned a ton. And there's no better time to get more education than when you're a business owner, because you have a sandbox and a playground to apply all of the things that you're learning. 
you learn about how companies scale. You learn about how companies evaluate acquisitions. There's a lot of mergers and acquisitions, things that come up in MBAs. And so my business partner has an MBA. I have an MBA. A bunch of our employees have MBAs. And so we think about these things quite often. And then just a little fun fact about me, travel is my vice. Uh, I mentioned I was on a three and a half week vacation and, you know, I went to Italy for like 16 days, was off beforehand, off afterhand. And, I, and that is just, it really comes back into why should I buy an agency? Why should I scale up? Well, when you have more revenue, you can afford to have really amazing people on your team who can operate the business that give you the freedom of time that most business owners want. So acquisitions can be a gateway to a lot of amazing things. So here's a growth curve of our agency. And so on the left-hand side, you see how many millions we are. And on the bottom, that's the month. So at the 12 month mark, you know, we were around 4 million at the 24 month mark, you know, call it eight. And then you see this curve start to get a little bit steeper and then really steep and then steeper and steeper. And what you can probably deduce is that this is when we started to make acquisitions. And so as we started to make acquisitions, this growth accelerated. It went further Northeast for lack of a better term on the chart. But at the same time, we didn't stop writing business. The number one mistake that people make when they acquire agencies is they think to themselves, they say, okay, well, I'm going to get all this revenue. My debt service is this. I'll hire one person to service it. And then I can put two or 300,000 more dollars in my pocket. And, you know, that is a strategy and that is something that can work really well. However, it is not conducive to long-term health and growth of the agency if that is what your goal is. It also tends to not get you any additional favors from your carrier rep, whether you're, you know, a, on an Allstate, a farmer's agent, uh, independent agent. When you make these acquisitions, the carrier rep is generally expecting to get more out of that book of business. And so here's our growth curve. This is how the growth has happened. You see it's flattened out a little bit in the last six to 12 months, and that's because we've slowed acquisitions down. And I'll talk a little bit about why. So just to talk through it here. We look at acquisitions through the lens that more is better, okay? But why should we acquire businesses? And those reasons vary depending on the time frame, the incentives involved, this where the agency is stated right now. And so let me walk you through some of the acquisitions we've made and why we made them. So in 2020 was when we made our first acquisition. So we opened July 1st, 2018. And we made our first acquisition in December of 2020. So right around the 18 month mark. And so the question was, was, all right, you were about 7 million or so. And we were on a scratch contract for, for Allstate. And the scratch contract, and if anyone's been on a scratch contract, pretty much doesn't matter what company you're with. Everybody knows those scratch contracts are like a rocket ship. But they're not a rocket ship forever. They tend to decrease in value over time. The commission rate that you get decreases over time. And so when we had a scratch contract, the, the enhanced compensation was amazing. But then the company came in and said, look, we're actually going to cut the renewal a little bit, but we're going to give you this variable comp type program. So we started running the math. And what we quickly realized was that it was more valuable to write new business on an established agency comp plan than it was to write in our scratch contract, the last 12 months of the 40 month curve that we had. And so we said, how do we get access to this? And the company basically said, well, you can graduate your scratch contract, but then we were leaving tons of money on the table. So we asked the question, so couldn't we buy an established agency and write all of our new business in the new book that we bought? And they said, sure, why not? So the first move was a hundred percent strategic to unlock newer, better, compensation on our new business that we were writing. We didn't want to forego the renewals or the bonus we had on the scratch side, but we wanted to unlock higher compensation. And so as the companies continue to change things, again, doesn't matter which carrier you're with or if you're independent, things are constantly changing. So thinking about as the environment changes, how can you strategically move your pieces to maximize any type of compensation you get without giving up what you already have. And so we bought a $2.7 million book and we bought it at a 2.25 multiple. And so just for comparison purposes, on the Allstate side, the contract value is 1.5X. We have a guaranteed 1.5X after the five-year mark. And so this agency that we bought was a 30 plus year agent, 
great retention, great loss ratio, all of these things. But they wanted, I think, 2.5x. I think we negotiated down to 2.25x. And we didn't really know what we were doing at the time. We just knew that it was worth it, even if we overpaid to get access to higher compensation. And so for us, the goal was not the revenue. It was not the ROI. It was not the profit. It was access to a new comp plan. So then we fast forward into 2021. This first this first acquisition goes great. Everyone says your retention is going to drop. Well, it didn't. It actually went up. There's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons for that was that the, the previous agent was a 30-year agent who closed their office during COVID, had one person answering phones, and the customers hadn't heard from their agent in two years. So when we got that book, we have a, a you know a 10, 10 touch contact strategy. We reached out to every single new client three times on email, three times on mail, two phone calls, and a couple texts. Retention went up. We said, this is pretty easy. Let's do this thing again. So we go back to the company and we say, hey, we want to buy another agency. And they came to us and they said, well, do you want to buy a scratch contract? And we said, no. And the reason was, was because there was all these handcuffs. If, if, you, if you had an agency that was established and you bought a scratch contract, yeah, it was an amazing opportunity for revenue, but you had all these requirements that you had to hit. And if you didn't hit them, your scratch contract got paid nothing. So we said, no, thank you. So we started to move forward on another small established book. But this time we knew what we were doing. We said, you know, we said, how can we find something that's a better price? So we paid just over the contract value. And I'll talk a little bit about how we did that, but we did not source this deal ourselves. We talked to people at the company and said, who do you know who might be willing to sell their agency, who might be maybe not hitting their goals and might not have a choice to either leave or get their numbers up or who might be ready to retire. And so we got introduced to somebody who was ready to retire. They asked for, you know, I think 1.7 or 1.8. We offered them 1.6 just over contract value. And that was great. But then we said, well, what if we buy two agencies? Can we buy two at once? And because that scratch contract kept coming back up and they said, look, the handcuffs aren't there anymore. They've made changes, everything like that. And so we got introduced to the scratch contract there was only 475,000 premium, really no revenue to speak of. But again, it gave us an opportunity to unlock a new compensation plan. And so you see the strategy here changing, right? One acquisition is for additional revenue, right? If we can buy it at 1.6 and we expect a customer to stick around for seven or eight years, that's easy math. You have five to six years of profit. The second one is a small book that we paid a higher multiple for, for an opportunity to have upside. We bet on ourselves for lack of a better term. It went really well. Fast forward to 2022, we say, let's do it again. We buy a $2.5 million book. We did this 100%. 100% was a revenue play. We got this one below contract value. Off-market deal, not through a broker. We reached out to people. Somebody said, I'm interested in selling. 1.4 multiple, $2.5 million book. In 2023, we did it. Again, you start to see a pattern. We said, Let's just keep buying. Let's just keep buying if we can find the right price. And what we had done at this point was that because we're buying these books all cash, right? We're using a bank to get that cash, but because a lot of the brokers knew we would pay all cash, knew we would get approval from the company, they started to come to us with opportunities because we are a well-qualified buyer. We made it known that we wanted to buy agencies. So we get approached and this is where the beauty of rate increases really come in. We negotiated this deal at 1.5x on a $2.3 million book. We could not get the deal closed until you know four or five months down the line based on some rules. So we said, hey, we'll, we'll give you a higher price. I think we gave them, I think we offered 1.4x. We gave them 1.5, gave them a little bit of a kicker and said, if you wait four or five months and close at this date, it'll be fine. So they did that. Well, a bunch of rate increases hit. And by the time we took possession of that book, that book was almost $3 million in premium. So if we do an effective multiple, it might have been closer to 1x. In 2024, right, we just closed one earlier this year. And for us, we've slowed down how big do we want to be. So we said, look, we want to buy a book. And the reason we want to buy a book now is no longer revenue, no longer size, but we want access to additional markets and additional geography. Another part of the challenge was that the bigger you get, the harder it is to hit your year-end goals or your monthly goals or all of your qualifiers that you need to hit to stay the highest tier with whatever carrier or company you represent. But the way that the, the strategy works is that if we are in a different market, those goals are separate. So how do we continue to grow 
without locking ourselves out on goals that put us in a position where we have to continue to spend more, stay on a hamster wheel. And then if we trip, the fall is going to hurt really bad. So what we did is this acquisition was again, strategic, not about revenue, more about access to markets, $348,000 book. This is the type of agency that nobody wants to buy. We gave them contract value and we move forward, right? And so the whole point of me talking about this is to say that agencies are more than a multiple. Everybody wants to ask, what multiple should I pay for an agency? And that is the wrong question. The question that you need to ask yourself is, why do I want to buy an agency? And so over here, you see Mr. Wonderful on the right. He's saying to cash flow, right? Number one, whenever you make an acquisition, it should be to cash flow, either directly through the book that you're buying yourself or through opportunity on a new comp plan, geography, market access, et cetera, et cetera. So think about agencies as more than a multiple. A multiple is a tool in a toolbox on evaluating agencies. And the most thing, most important thing to talk about is a Different assets have different worth to different people. And we talk about that $348,000 agency in Tennessee. To an outside buyer, that book is worthless. An outside buyer would might as well start scratch than buy a $350,000 book. To an internal buyer who's trying to get bigger or get more revenue so they can fund growth, it's again, it's not worth it. They're going to use up their acquisition. You can get one or two a year. They're going to use up that acquisition on a $348,000 book. That book was essentially worthless to everybody else. But because we wanted access to those markets, it was valuable to us. So don't worry too much about the multiple. Because the multiple assumes that the value is the same to everybody. The value is different to everybody. A multiple is helpful when comparing similar books. So if you have three agencies that you can buy, one's 5 million, one's 5.5, and one's 6 million, they're all similar on retention, geography, et cetera. That's when a multiple could be a great tool. It is a high level view to say, okay, what are these books comparing at from a price perspective? But if you, things are not comparable on book metrics, size, location, the multiple isn't really that helpful. Another thing to think about is the strategic and cash flow value vary. It's, I've talked about this a little bit already, but if your cash flow is going to be very, very good on a $5 million book at a 3.0 multiple, that might still be worth it to you compared to somebody else who says, look, in order for me to buy this $5 million book, I have to spend another $50,000 a month on marketing to make sure I hit my new goals. That might only be worth a 2.0 multiple to them or a 1.0 multiple. So situation matters. Another piece to think about with multiples is does this come with staff or does this not come with staff? And so one of the biggest concerns that I've heard from agents all over the country, regardless of carrier, regardless of whether they're captive or independent, is as renewals come down, my book is getting devalued. And it's a hard argument to debunk. Just truly, it is. But the way I want you to think about it is, is think about selling a book versus selling a business. And one of the main differences between that is if I have five agencies that make up my 40 million and I sell 6 million of that 40, but there's no staff, no marketing processes, nothing that comes with it. They're just buying the revenue. That multiple is going to be significantly lower because all they're doing is valuing either the access or the cash flow. However, if I were to sell my entire agency with all the staff, all the marketing processes, all the secret sauce, if you will, that multiple might be three or four X because somebody can walk in, get buy it with debt, immediately cash flow, and just keep it running down the road. And so staff versus no staff will drastically change what it is that you are paying for a book. And that's where it goes back to different people. If I buy a $5 million agency, I might not need the staff. If an outside buyer buys the agency, they might want and need the staff. So an outside buyer might pay more where an internal buyer might pay less. So remember, context matters. Agencies are more than a multiple. So I've already just talked through that. So let's talk about financing a little bit. And so one of the, one of the biggest challenges, I think, when it comes to buying an agency is sometimes people think about like, oh, man, like I have no debt on my agency. I've built this from scratch. I've used no debt. 
I don't like debt. I don't want to do it. And what I would always tell people is that debt is a tool, just like any tool. And debt is okay if debt is used uh, thoughtfully and intentionally uh, and not recklessly. And so if we think about a chart here and we say, let's look at four types of agencies, a 1 million, a two and a half million, a 5 million and a $10 million, all of these agencies. Okay. And let's assume, uh, I think here, what I did was I assumed an 8% renewal rate, which I think is probably on par with most companies at, at this point, maybe a little higher, uh, but let's just assume eight. Right. And so if we think about a $1 million book here, I put a 0.8 X multiple, you know, and so under contract value, right? For, if we're comparing across agencies or across companies, think about just slightly 20% under contract value. And the reason for that is one, there's not a lot of revenue there, which means it's not that attractive to an outside buyer or an internal buyer. And so we say, okay, maybe 0.8. On a 2.5, again, not a ton of revenue there. Maybe it's at contract value. As we start to get to a $5 million book, now we're going you know, 75% over contract value. 10 million? maybe 150% over contract value. And so, you know, don't walk into the multiple so much because I know a farmer's agency, an Allstate agency, an independent agency all operate on different multiple scales based on what is market average. But remember, agencies are more than a multiple. I'll just keep saying it. But second, the bigger the agency is, the higher the multiple tends to be. And the reason for that is because if we look at the price paid and the loan payment at a 7.5% interest rate on a 10-year note, you can see what the loan payment costs on a yearly basis and the amount of free cash flow that you free up. So if you buy a $10 million book that has 800,000 in revenue at a two and a half X multiple to service that debt over the next 10 years and pay your interest in principle, 300,000 a year, but you get, oh, I did my math here. You get 500,000 of free cash flow, $500,000 to, to go right back into the book whether that's for staff, whether that's for marketing, whether that's to establish middle management, whether that's to establish you know, uh, specialty roles, director of marketing. And so the more revenue you buy at once, the more freedom and free cash flow that you get. And so a couple of things to consider here. If you can increase the renewal, that gives you even more upside. And so a lot of agents who are selling their agencies right now are, have dropped a tier or they're not hitting monthly goals and their renewal rate is lower. But you, as a high-performing agent who buys that agency, might be able to quickly increase that renewal by one or two percentage points. That is instant return for you, instant return. And so it could be even more upside, even more value to you. And another thing to think about is always think about how your goals change. I think on the Allstate side, there's something called uh, like, there's like AAP, uh, there's year-end bonuses on the farmer side. There's now Farmers Agency Premier, understanding your monthly goals to hit your uh, your accelerated compensation. Same thing on the independent side. Are you going to keep your carrier reps happy? Do you have overrides negotiated? Make sure you're thinking about how your goals change as the size of your agency changes. Everybody thinks they're going to buy a 5 or $10 million agency, and then they're going to max out all their scorecards, but they don't do the math on what it will take to max the scorecard at their new size, how much money they need to spend. They get smacked in the face, then they're licking their wounds. How do I know this? Well, because it's happened to me. So don't let it happen to you. Andrew, before we move on, can we quickly go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Um, this to me is really important because none of this matters unless we know how much more cash flow we're going to have. For sure. My view, I'm looking at the $1 million book of business. So 1 million. 80,000 in revenue, 0.8x multiple, yep. the price, 64,000. Now the loan payments, that someone can quickly find on a free online calculator, right? They yep. put in 64,000, 10 year loan. What interest rate would you put in there? I would do seven and a half right now. Okay. Seven and a half percent. That'll give you your loan payments of It'll give you a monthly loan payment and then just multiply it by 12. So that's 9264. So that gives you 55,000 a year of free cash flow. That's four and a half thousand dollars per month and an extra million dollar in book in most cases doesn't require another full-time service person. So really you're buying right. your extra forty five hundred dollars a month in free cash flow. That's right. Huge. 
And you just reinvest that back into growth, right? How do you get that back into salespeople, into marketing, into operational roles? And and I'll and I'll revise this chart. I, I realized when I was doing this, I I did some my math wrong. So I just want to I want to own that right here. It's you know the free cash flow is actually in some cases higher and in some cases lower, but we'll we'll get that revised. The point that I want people to take away from it though is that servicing the the debt leaves a lot of cash in your hand, and so using debt is okay, right? It's like, think about how much debt you are comfortable with. And think about, you know, if your book is worth a million dollars, are you comfortable having 50% of that value tied up in debt? Or do you want 30? Or do you want 20? And there, of course, are benchmarks out there. But the benchmarks are just the average, right? Just the average person. And every single person has different risk tolerance for debt. One of the best things to think about is interest coverage ratio. How many months of interest can you pay based on the cash you have on hand? And so if you are a little bit nervous about debt, the solution to that is just holding more cash in hand, put it in a high interest savings account or even like three month CDs. So you get something out of it, but having a little more cash on hand in case the market conditions shift, you're not, you're not behind on your note, yada, yada, yada. So. Yeah. Yeah. And the ability for an agent to go from being a small agency owner, mil million dollar book of business to a mega agent, 10 million or, or higher, you can do that in a span of a few years. Absolutely. If, you, if you're a $1 million agency now, the company oftentimes won't let you buy a five, $10 million book of business, but they'll let you buy a $1 million book of business. You've doubled in size. You're at 2 million. You grow that book of business you buy another $2 million book of business. So you wore 2 million plus two, you're now 4 million. Absolutely. And three, four years down, you can continue double in size. And that's not exactly what you've done. You've showed how big a book uh, you okay. purchased. I know of agents who have purchased massive books and now they're 20 million plus. Yeah. And they've been agents for four or five years. Yeah. There, you know, there is no right or wrong strategy, right? Like, uh, I talk about our banking partner on the next slide, and, and I'll get there in one second, but I, I buy what they refer to as the scratch and dent special, right? Mm -hmm. We're buying smaller agencies that nobody seems to want, and we're buying them at contract value. And I'll talk a little bit more about why we do that. Other agents say, look, I'm at five. I need to get to 10 or 12 so I can hit my goals. It makes more sense to buy a bigger book at a higher multiple, right? Again, strategic value different. There is no right or wrong answer. The question is, why do you want to do it? Is it acquisition or, or sorry, is it cash flow? Is it revenue? Is it access? And so to Vlad, your point, right? Going from five to 15 can be life-changing. If you're already at 30 though, and buying 10 more million, that doesn't have the same effect that it might, right? So it's all just about what is your strategy and what is your goal? So one of the most important things you can do if you start buying agencies or are exploring buying agencies is having an amazing banking partner. There's a bunch of them out there. People have uh, their own preferences. Here's mine. I love Wintrust. I work exclusively with Wintrust. And until they give me a reason not to, uh, I probably won't even look at anybody else. And even if they did upset me, I would say, look, here's what I'm upset about. And I know they would make it right. Because Wintrust uh, used to be Allstate Bank. So Allstate used to have their own banking division, similar, I think, to Farmers Credit Union. And then Allstate sp sp spun that off. And so they got bought by Wintrust and they created something called Agent Finance. And you know now they're expanded on the farmer side, independent side, Allstate side. And what I love about them is that they understand the compensation plans that the companies are putting out. And so when you go to a local bank or a local credit union, sometimes they'll look at the compensation and the revenue schedules and they'll just get a little bit spooked. And they say, I don't know, this is super risky. And it can be hard to get that loan where Wintrust understands it inside and out. And so I would recommend whether it's Wintrust or somebody else, Kay Martin is who I use at Wintrust. You can email her directly. She's super responsive, amazing, fun to work with, which is not common out of a banking partner can be a little dry sometimes, but find somebody that you trust. It's better to find somebody that you trust rather than somebody who can get you a better rate. If somebody got me 0.3% better on my interest rate, that might save me tens of thousands of dollars over the 10 years. But if I don't know and trust that partner, I'd probably still pay more for somebody that I do. So that's the first piece. The next one is be collaborative with your bank. A lot of times people will go to their bank and say, this is what I want to do. And they start saying everything that they want to do. Instead of stopping and asking and say, hey, here's how I'm thinking about this. 
I'm, I've run the numbers on this strategy, like, you know, a 10 year note at this interest rate, you know, roughly what am I maybe missing? Are there any other ways to structure this deal? Are there any other ways to structure this loan? And, and here's what I'm trying to achieve. What ideas do you have? Because if you're collaborative with your banking partner, you'd be surprised how creative they can get on structuring deals and structuring deals can be really fun. If you enjoy structuring deals, if you don't enjoy structuring deals, Having the banking partner help you do that is, is huge. But even if you do enjoy doing it, spitballing ideas, every time I talk to, to Wintrust, whether we're buying an agency or I'm talking to one of our clients that we work with that are buying an agency, they, they come up with some new cool way to structure things that help them hit their goal. So be collaborative. If you're open mind to creative approach, you're going to find new ways to do things that might be a limited time. Like maybe there's a six month window to, to structure something a certain way that won't be available in six months. So be open-minded. And then this is super important. Do not worry about overpaying for the agency if the structure is right. And so a lot of people will do a standard 10 year loan. But if somebody came to me and said, I want you to pay a five X multiple on this agency. And I said, well, that's absurdly high based on all the other multiples they said but look i'll i'll hold as the seller i'll hold the note and you can pay me over 20 years well now i'm intrigued because the cash flow is so different than a 10-year note and so the price is something that sometimes people look at and they say oh man you've overpaid for that agency well that could be true but it could also not be true based on the way you structure the deal in a lot of negotiations Usually one person gets the price and one person gets the structure, right? If we think about how do we create win-wins in negotiations, if you try to beat them up on the price and beat them up on the structure, you know, maybe you get it, but maybe you don't. But a lot of times if somebody is really locked in on price, they really want a higher price for that agency than you want to pay, start getting creative on the structure to make it, make it worth it and make it fit your strategy, okay? So the other piece here is how do we structure some deals? Standard, I talked about this, 10-year financing is, is the standard note. We say, look, I'm going to buy this agency. Maybe I put nothing down. Maybe I put 10% down. It kind of depends on your credit, how much collateral you have, how much you, equity you have in your agency. But the standard is a 10-year financing right now, 7.5%. Something that a lot of people are doing right now is they'll do a, a mixture of bank debt and seller financing. And of course, the bigger the book, typically the more likely the seller is going to have to hold part of that note. Not always. But typically, right? Because if somebody's buying a $10 million or a $20 million agency, the bank might say, well, I'm only willing to lend 80% of that value. So either you need to come up with it on a down payment or the seller needs to hold the note. In some cases, you can get people to do 100% seller financing, right? I, I have somebody that I'm working with right now. They were talking to me about an acquisition and you know, we just kept talking about ways to structure the idea. And he said, you know, what if you just pay this person a salary for two years, you just give them like a two-year contract, you pay them a salary, they come add value in your agency, and they just give you the keys to their agency. That's essentially seller financing. You're saying, just give me your book of business. I'll pay you a salary each year that's less than the cash flow of the business, but now you don't have to worry about it. You have a very structured, specific thing you need to do, and maybe they find that they're better in a support role than being the entrepreneur themselves. So 100% seller finance is available. It typically is going to be a smaller type agency, and you typically need to give them something else, whether that's some type of cash flow, payment stream, a job, but you can find win-wins. Understand what the other person wants, understand what you want, and talk through that together. Really important is do not sleep on lines of credit. If you do not have a line of credit with your agency right now, I would highly recommend that you go get one, even if you don't use it. A couple reasons why. One, Maybe you have a very limited opportunity, but not enough cash on hand to take advantage of that. That could be market conditions. You want to spend a bunch of money on leads or mail or marketing. It could also be that, hey, maybe there's an agency for sale that's $60,000 and you don't want to take a 10-year note on a $60,000 purchase, but you have a $100,000 line of credit, hit that line of credit, buy it, pay it back. Lines of credit are just extra credit that are pre-negotiated, that's ready to go, that you can access within days. You don't have to go through a one, two, three month underwriting cycle. If you do not have a line of credit on your agency right now, call your bank. If you need one, Wintrust does lines of credit. Just get one. It costs you almost nothing. And in some cases, it costs you nothing to have if you don't use it. Have the flexibility, 
have the ability to use it, get a line of credit. And again, don't worry about overpaying if you structure the deal right. I want to emphasize this. The structure in a lot of cases is more important than the price of the agency. So let's talk a little bit about how to can, find an agency. I quickly ask a question. Yeah. Can you give me an example? You said something that stood out. One person gets the price in a negotiation. Yep. He gets the price. The other gets the structure. Can you give me an example of that being the case? Yeah. So let's say that you went out and you wanted to buy an agency and, and let's just use nice round numbers. And you think the agency's worth $750,000. And that's and that's what you think it's worth. But the, the seller really wants a million or in some cases might need a million to pay off their own debts or their own things that they need. And so, you know, you come in at 750,000, you say, I'm going to do an all cash deal. I'm going to finance it, but you're going to get all your cash up front today. And they say, well, no, I need a million dollars for this book. This is what I need. And then you start to say, okay, like, well, it's not worth it for me if I have to give you all cash for a million dollars. Part of the reason for that could be that you don't want to deploy that much cash. Or maybe if you take a loan for a million dollars versus $750,000, you're, you're taking on too much debt that you don't feel comfortable with, or the cash flow doesn't work, right? Now the cash flow calculations all messed up. So then you come back and you say something like, okay, well, I'll make you a deal then. I will pay you a million dollars for this agency, but instead I'm going to give you $600,000 in cash today. And then I'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, at a 4% interest for four years. And what that allows you to do is it says, look, okay, well, I'm going to give you less cash today. It's going to help my cash flow. And then I'm going to pay you hundred grand a year at 4% but maybe you put some caveats in, right? Maybe you say something like, well, if I get a year end bonus, I pay you that hundred thousand dollars, no matter what. If I don't pay, the, if I don't get a year end bonus, well, perhaps what I do is I, I have the option to pay that hundred thousand dollars or not. If I pay it, no interest is accrued. If I do pay, if I don't pay it, 4% accrues, but that four, that $400,000 is due at the five-year mark regardless. It has to be paid off in five years. And so that gives the person a higher purchase price. They get more money, but they might have to wait a little bit longer for it. It also gives you time and flexibility to say, I'm going to take this, not hurt my cash flow. And five years from now, if I have $200,000 left on the note, I'll just go borrow it from the bank because I'll have a bigger size, I'll have more cash, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can get as creative as you want. You can even do things like earnout provisions. Hey, if you want a million dollars, well, you know what? That's fine. I'll give you $700,000 today and $100,000 each of the next three years if retention stays at 87% or higher. If retention drops to 83 or lower, I give you 50,000. If retention drops to 75% or lower, I give you 25,000. If retention 70%, I give you nothing. And they might say, well, that's not fair. I don't want that. You say, well, look, I you want to get more money that's more than I'm willing to pay. I need some protections that this book is not just going to fall apart because everyone in your community uh, is now not with me because you're not there or because you opened an independent agency across the street or your wife opened an agency across the street and now they're all just moving over, right? So there's so many ways to do it. There's so many ways to structure it. Great. Awesome. Thank you for that. Absolutely. So let's talk about some ways to find an agency. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, a lot of people go to a broker. Nothing wrong with that. If it's your first time buying, the first agency we bought, we went through a broker. We said, hey, we want to buy an agency, help us find it. You know, they back back and forth negotiations. Brokers can be immensely helpful on buying or selling. It just depends, you know, how comfortable are you doing this yourself? That's the most common way. Another way is just doing some cold outreach, right? Just go to your market leaderboard or your district leaderboard or your state leaderboard and say, who's at the bottom of the leaderboard and has been for the last month or two, and just maybe shoot them an email and say, hey, I'm looking to buy some agencies this year. Was curious if you'd be interested in selling. Just ask them the question. You might be surprised the answer that you get. And if you find an off-market deal, a lot of times you can negotiate a much better price because they are not. They might not even be thinking about it, but they're like, for the right price, I might walk away. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. Let's have a conversation. So another one is talk to your district leader and say, hey, do you have anybody in mind that might be a fit for you and for me to purchase? Can we make this a win-win? A lot of times they do have people in mind. Not always, but a lot of times they know who's struggling or who's maybe wanting to get out. 
Another one is setting, just set intentions. Just tell people, tell people around you, hey, I'm looking to buy one agency or two agencies this year, and I'm looking to acquire 7 million or 4 million in premium. Put that out there and watch people say, hey, I heard you were looking to buy an agency. I'm thinking about selling, right? Advertise that you are a well-qualified buyer. And the last one is ask your banker. Your banker probably has people who are struggling to pay their loan note that need to sell sooner rather, or are underwater, even worse, might be underwater on their note. The banks know a lot of people who need to sell or want to sell. So those are some quick ways to find an agency. And so this is really, really important, all right? How do we get approval to do this? We unfortunately live in a world where we sometimes can't just go buy it. We have to get approval from a third party. And sometimes that can be frustrating if you're a business owner, uh, but it's but it's the game that we live in today. And so we think about this, this trying to triple Venn diagram, right? Buyer, seller, and carrier. It needs to be a win for everybody. If it's not a win for everybody, it's probably not going to happen. So let's think about it, right? There's three parties involved. What usually happens is a buyer and a seller like link up. They work a bunch of things out. Then they go to the carrier and the carrier says, well, hold on a second. I don't know. And then they kill the deal. And what I would recommend is instead go to the person who can block you first. Who is the person most likely to say no or to block you? Get their buy-in and then no go negotiate with the seller. Ideally, with somebody they have in mind. Ideally, someone they have in mind that's an off-market deal. Third is get your ducks in a row before you ask. Don't go ask. And then when they say, what are you going to do with all the extra cash flow? Like stare at them blankly. You need to have an answer of, hey, here's what I'm going to do with the cash flow. Here's why it's good for the seller. Here's why it's good for me. Here's why it's good for the carrier. Because what their biggest fear is, any carrier rep, any district, state, doesn't matter what level of management, they're afraid you're going to take all that revenue, take it out of the business, go buy a Ferrari, or go buy a lake house, or send your kids to college, whatever it is. You're going to take that money out of the business. And what they want is they want that money reinvested. And the reality is it's your prerogative as a business owner to do whatever the hell you want. However, if they can block you or they can deny the request, to take it, take that book of business, you kind of have to play the game a little bit. So get your ducks in a row, have a vision for what you're trying to achieve, okay? And so this is super important. There are a lot of agencies out there. Do not fall in love. If there's one available, there's one available. But a lot of cases, there's multiple available if you're patient enough, okay? Don't fall in love. The people fall in love oftentimes on the first agency they buy. Or the first big agency, they want to be big so bad, or they say, hey, I'm 6 million, but if I buy this 10 million, I'll be 16, I'll be huge, and now I can roll with like the big boys, whatever. And then they overpay, or they buy a book that has a bunch of problems. Don't fall in love. Define what your goal is. Why do you want to do this? If your goal is just to be a mega, that is not a good reason. If your goal is to be a mega so you can have additional cash flow, have specialty roles, operational leaders, so you have more freedom, that's a good goal. Be specific, right? Use a smart goal. Does the book that you're looking at support that goal? If yes, negotiate, move forward. If not, keep looking. There will be more. I promise you there will be more. Walk away. If you're not willing to walk away, you have no leverage in a deal, whether you're buying it or selling it, okay? Here's some of, some of my mistakes that I've made, all right? So here's some due diligence, just things to think about. One, moving the office without knowing the demographics, okay? So the second agency I bought that was established uh, was about an hour south of Atlanta. And one of the things we always put in contingency was we'd say, look, we will buy this agency at this price contingent on approval to move the agents within a certain geographic location. Because staffing a, an office across the state is not generally conducive to the type of operation that we run. So I said, I'm going to move this office. So we buy this agency. I remember five days before we're closing, we're down there, you know, just kind of seeing if we want any of the equipment or whatever. And the owner says to me, he says, you know, there's a lot of walk-ins in this office, right? And I was like, oh, I didn't know that, you know, <laughs> didn't really think about it. And so I was like, all right, well, that, you know, it is what it is. Close the office, move it an hour away. These, the customers were pissed. They were pissed. And, you know, I was so used to being in an environment in Atlanta where everybody was in like the ages of 30 to 60 years old. It was a very family age, working age type population. People don't walk into the office. You're in a metro area. This was in Peachtree City. 
to retirement community. People have nothing. They were so upset. They were going to other agents. It was causing a bunch of problems, right? So know the demographics, understand how many walk-ins before you move it or close it. Another one, what languages are spoken in the book? So we bought an agency that had people who spoke Korean uh, and spoke a lot of Spanish. And you know we had one Spanish speaker, but after buying this agency, we needed three. And then we have nobody who speaks Korean. And you know it was in a part of Atlanta that had a lot of Korean population, you know? So that was a learning lesson, right? Is asking these little things, like, is there anything interesting about this book or anything about the customer set that I might need to know? Third, understand what type of service the customers are used to receiving. We bought an agency, um, one in 2023, where every customer was given the expectation they could call the agent cell phone, the agent owner cell phone. That is not the type of business that we run. They do not call my cell phone. It's just not ever going to happen. And so the only the only time that that's going to happen is if it's a shock loss or a fatality loss or something like that. Then, But for a bill, it's just not going to happen, right? But the customers who were used to calling the owner revolted. They were so upset. They couldn't believe that we could be so barbaric and not allow them to speak to the agent. So understanding what type of service are they expecting to receive? We assumed it was like that first agency we bought or that second agency where it's like, yeah, maybe we'll walk in, but they're really not getting any proactive service from the agent, right? Wrong. So understand that question. Fourth, is the owner going away? Are they retiring? Are they opening with a different carrier? Are they going independent? Are they still talking to the customers, right? That was an issue too. We bought one of these books. People would be like, oh, my customer's calling me super upset. And after about three months, right, had to set a boundary and say, look, I need to correct you on something. This isn't your customer anymore. And I want them to be happy. They want to be happy. And you want them to be happy. What I need you to do moving forward is I need you to stop calling me about this. Email this person at the agency and we will take care of it. But you need to stop talking to your former customers because you are no longer a licensed agency owner. Okay. So understand what's the dynamic there if people have relationship with the, with the owner. And fifth, so important, compliance, compliance, compliance. Assume that any agency you bought didn't do anything around compliance and that there's a bunch of ticking time bombs in there. Document everything, get every report you can before you buy the agency, have a line in the sand and any compliance issues you find. buying this agency to hold it? Or are you going to try to flip it in a couple of years? How you work that book will change. And then most importantly, when looking for an agency, right? And this has been my strategy. What might other people not value that you might value more? And that is where you have arbitrage opportunities where you can find really, really good deals. So last thing here, we talk about this idea of are you flipping? So our whole strategy is we want to buy the scratch and dent, fix it up, and flip it. So buy the agency, buy it at contract value. Okay. Then you build and improve that book. So if we buy a $2 million book, we're going to keep writing new business in it and grow it to five, six, seven, eight million. All the while we're cash flowing it, we're servicing it with debt, and we're improving the retention, the size, the bundling in the book. Now we sell it at a 2.5 or a 3.0 multiple. You take the difference, you buy back in, rinse and repeat. It's very similar to real estate. The key is you have to have systems and processes to grow that book, to improve retention on that book. But if you can do this, it is a great way to help the company because they get more. It's a great way if you have an LSP or a, a producer that wants to open their own agency to help them get off to a certain sell that to them. There's a lot of ways to do it, okay? So- 
that's what we have on agency uh, purchasing, right? So if you want to work with me or my team, right, things we do is we do one-on-one agent coaching. So if you're thinking about buying an agency, you're wanting to scale, you're wanting to really rebuild your sales team, we do one-on-one agent coaching. We have the internet lead service that Vlad talked about. And then if you need help valuing and negotiating on agencies, we do that. We are not brokers. We do not broker agencies. We work with eight brokers. But if you want a third party opinion on how to value an agency and how to position the structure or how it would help with that, we offer that as well. And so the agency buying checklist, that's where you can email me. My email is right here, but you can also go to insurance saleslab.com slash Andrew. So. Wow. Phenomenal. Slow clap for that. Thanks, man. Thanks. Incredible. Hey, I know you got to go here in just a couple of minutes. You're starting a call. Um, yeah. If you have a question for Andrew, drop it in the chat. I'll read through those. Uh, we will wrap up exactly at the top of the hour, maybe like a minute to spare. Okay. Uh, how do you make sure outside of signing a non-compete that the agency owner who sells you the book doesn't just start poaching your clients when they go independent? I think you don't, right? Here's here's the issue. You don't. And so even if you have a non-compete, the question you have to ask yourself is, are you willing to spend the money to enforce that non-compete? Are you willing to spend the money on attorneys to enforce it? And do you have the ability and the systems to prove that they are violating it? And so two things, right? Is like one, meet the seller, meet the seller and the owner, ask them what they're doing, right? Do you get a good feeling about them or do they feel kind of sketchy, right? Trust that gut. But more importantly, what can you actually do? That's where the outreach to the customers being very proactive. Something that we do is that we actually incur it. We, we don't encourage, we ask the outgoing agent, send something but a month before they close to say, hey, these are the new agents and here's what they are. And we approve that messaging and it has to go from the old agent to the new one, right? Because we want to set up and have a nice warm handoff. And then we've got to do our job to get in front of them with mail, email, and calls to introduce ourselves, set expectations and say, look, like, yes, the agent on the door might be changing, but your service should only be as good or improved. Awesome. Uh, a question came up about keeping the location intact, meaning not just buying a book of business, but also keeping the uh, the actual operation there. Before you answer the question, two things came up here, two comments. One, uh, Kathy said, 10,000% recommend consulting with Andrew. I want to second Thanks, that. Kathy. Go to insurancesaleslab.com forward slash Andrew to get in touch. Uh, and then someone else asked about the recording. This recording will be sent out and it will also be published on the Insurance Sales Lab platform. Yep. Uh, Andrew, do you keep the location? Do you pull it away? We've always moved it. Doesn't mean it's the right choice, right? Think about if it's if it's something that you think you can easily staff and there's a lot of walk-in traffic, it might make sense to to keep that location. If if the staff is staying on when you buy that agency, it can make a lot of sense. For us, we are fully remote in our agency. And so we have people all over the country. And so trying to say we go from a pool of looking in 48 states for producers to looking in one town and one state for someone who can come in the office, it just doesn't work for us, right? It doesn't work with our overall grand strategy. So it depends, right? And the other piece of it always is, is what's the rent on that place? If the rent's $5,000 a month and you can put it in a Regis suite for $800, then yeah, move it, right? Like it, it really just depends. We always close it. Doesn't mean it's always the right move. It's just what we tend to do. Folks, that's it for today. I see a lot of questions coming. Andrew yeah. will be back and he's going to do more training. I'm going to ask everybody to take a quick survey at the very end. When you end the Zoom session, it's going to ask you to answer three questions. Please do that for Andrew. That would mean the world to him, to me. We'll see you next time.